Back in 2009, Boeing's Silent Eagle aimed to make the world's most prolific air superiority fighter into something more by injecting stealth into the F-15's legendary DNA. The result may have been the most broadly capable F-15 the world had ever seen, delivered just in time to compete with what would become a foreign sales powerhouse, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Let's dive into the F-15 Silent Eagle. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. The F-15 Silent Eagle aimed to bridge the gap between 4th and 5th generation fighters, incorporating elements of the stealth and situational awareness you can find in the world's most advanced tactical jets into an already legendary fighter airframe. With 58,000 pounds of thrust on tap, internal weapons carriage capabilities, a reduced radar signature, advanced avionics, and the Strike Eagle's multi-role pedigree, this fighter may have been the most capable fourth-generation platform on the planet by the time it was rolled onto the flight lines of prospective buyers, hailing from everywhere from Canada to Japan. But the world was changing by the 2010s, and the skies above it were no exception. In an era of advanced and stealthy fighters fusing data on the fly and slipping past enemy radar arrays like James Bond and his trusty Walter PPK, the Silent Eagle was more like Robocop carrying a shotgun with a silencer. It was a mechanical powerhouse that could tiptoe through the sky and speak in hushed tones, but beneath that thin veneer of stealth, the F-15 SE was every bit the bruiser that it started out as. Which really comes as no surprise when you think about how the F-15 started. I mean, its journey to fruition began in the dogfights over Vietnam, but it found renewed focus when the Soviet Union unveiled their MiG-25 in 1967. Now, we didn't know a lot about the MiG-25 at the time, but from looking at it, we knew it was clearly fast. Its view from the front is defined by its giant ramjet inlets, and the engines in the back are big enough to have a picnic in. Based on their own studies of using large wings on high-speed aircraft, American engineers were pretty sure the MiG-25 was also highly maneuverable. So while the F-15 was already in development, the program shifted focus to becoming all about beating the Foxbat, or more appropriately, what the Air Force thought the Foxbat was. Of course, not long after, America would get their hands on a MiG-25, and they learned that it's not actually all that capable or scary at all. The F-15 had been invented to serve as a silver bullet to fight a Soviet monster fighter that seemingly had no peers on the world stage. But now that the Foxbat was understood to be a subpar competitor, the F-15 graduated from its perceived underdog status to becoming the most dominant air superiority fighter of its century. In 1986, the next iteration Eagle, dubbed the F-15E, took to the skies with a new focus on air-to-ground operations and conformal fuel tanks along either side of the fuselage to carry an additional 750 gallons on each side. This new Strike Eagle could carry just about every air-to-ground ordnance the U.S. had, including its latest variable-yield B-61 nuclear bombs. The Strike Eagle would beat out the unusual but very promising F-16XL for an Air Force contract and quickly become a competitor for the best multi-role fighter of its generation. In other words, this one airframe is a viable competitor for both the best air superiority and the best multi-role fighter of the 20th century. But as dominant as the F-15 may have been in the skies over the Cold War, the 21st century brought a whole new slew of challenges. By 2005, stealth had found its way into the fighter realm with the F-15's intended replacement, Lockheed Martin's incredible new F-22 Raptor. But the F-22 would be canceled early, with just 186 platforms delivered, so the F-15 soon found itself once again serving as America's primary air superiority fighter. Meanwhile, the F-15E was proving invaluable across conflicts in the Middle East. But it wasn't all good news for Boeing and its Eagle. The F-22 may have been canceled, but the F-15E's ground attack capabilities were now facing a new stealthy threat on the fighter sales market. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Now, Boeing had competed and lost for the Joint Strike Fighter contract with their X-32, which meant all of their hopes for lucrative fighter contracts were now resting squarely on the F-15's rapidly aging shoulders. An inspiration would strike in 2008 when Boeing's director for F-15 development programs, Brad Jones, met with a Korean general. I'll quote him here. 
A Korean general basically said, we have to have stealth, but can we live with the trade-offs? We listened. Stealth is very expensive to maintain. These guys will fly these airplanes for 30 plus years and technology will bypass stealth. Jones could see the writing on the wall. If Boeing wanted to continue selling its Cold War powerhouse to the US and its allies, it was time to give it a serious injection of 21st century tech that would make it look like a promising choice for nations that weren't ready to go all in on stealth fighters. But let there be no doubt, it would be an uphill climb. Boeing knew immediately that they had no hope of making an F-15 truly stealth. I mean, we're talking about an aircraft that's said to carry a 25 square meter radar cross-section. That's more than twice that of the heavy payload B-1B Lancer bomber, and at least 25 times bigger than an F-A-18 Super Hornet. So in order to make their Silent Eagle concept work, Boeing had to do two things. First, they had to bring the F-15's radar return down dramatically. And second, they had to convince potential buyers that stealth wasn't the only important factor to consider when looking to buy a new jet. In March of 2009, Boeing unveiled their new fighter, or maybe it's better to say the latest iteration of the F-15E and subsequent F-15SA. This new two-seat F-15SE Silent Eagle built upon the changes made for both the Strike Eagle and its more recent Saudi Arabian export sibling, but this time emphasized a reduction in the fighter's radar return alongside another round of avionics and system updates and upgrades. The result was a new F-15 that looked a lot like a stripped-down old F-15, but when you look closer, there were some very important changes. The biggest one had to be the 750-gallon conformal fuel tanks being removed from the fuselage and replaced with new conformal weapons bays. These were very similar in external design to the fuel tanks that they replaced, and that allowed the Silent Eagle to carry its firepower internally like a fifth-generation fighter without sacrificing the aerodynamic profile of the Strike Eagle that had already proven itself in combat time and time again. Now, obviously, carrying your missiles and bombs under wing or beneath the belly of the aircraft was standard fare for fourth-generation fighters, but they also produced a huge radar return. So by moving all of the weapons to internal storage areas, the Silent Eagle would have a significantly smaller radar cross-section than a standard armed F-15E. The conformal weapons bays were rated to carry everything from air-to-air -air weapons like the Sidewinder and AMRAM to air-to-ground weapons like the JDAM and small diameter bombs. One very important inclusion, for instance, was the AGM-88 Harm missile, which is the weapon of choice for wild weasel aircraft who are hunting for enemy air defense systems. In other words, the Silent Eagle could have been a very potent option for suppression of air defense operations. But the Silent Eagle could still stand and swing with the best of them, and those conformal weapons bays could be removed and replaced with standard Strike Eagle conformal fuel tanks, anytime a mission called for less stealth and more hate. Effectively, the Silent Eagle could trade its discretion for four additional weapon stations and 1,500 gallons of extra fuel. A BAE Digital Electronic Warfare Suite was added to supplement the aircraft's stealth with jamming capabilities, a long time an active electronically scanned array radar and an infrared search and track sensor for both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground operations. That infrared search and track sensor was vital for the F-15SE to hunt for enemy fighters without using active radar that would alert them of its presence. The Strike Eagle also has this capability, but it's housed within a sensor pod, which would be removed for the F-15SE. That made the addition of a sensor within the fuselage a necessary design change. The Silent Eagle would also leverage new fly-by-wire controls that were funded originally by Saudi Arabia for their F-15SA. Two external weapon stations allowed for an additional four air-to-air -air missiles anytime the F-15SE wasn't worried about being sneaky. And those could obviously be bolstered by using the weapon stations on Strike Eagle conformal fuel tanks. The Silent Eagle would also leverage the Joint Helmet Mounted Queuing System, or JHCMS, which was added to the Strike Eagle in 2010. This system effectively allows the pilot to aim the aircraft's weapons simply by turning his or her head, all while showing vital information directly in their field of view. This, alongside new 11 by 19 inch large area displays for both front and backseat drivers, would give the Silent Eagle a huge boost in situational awareness, which it goes without saying is incredibly valuable in a fight. The other most noticeable structural difference between the Strike Eagle and the Silent Eagle was in its tails. 
The F-15's twin vertical tails played a big role in the aircraft's large radar return, so the Silent Eagle's tails were canted 15 degrees outward, thus reducing their radar signature while providing a slight boost to lift. In fact, that added lift, Boeing claimed, gave the new semi-stealth fighter an extra 75 to 100 miles of range, which would offset a bit of what was lost when swapping out those conformal fuel tanks. To better understand how a 15 degree change in a vertical tail could really have that big of an effect, let's look to Alan Brown, who was Lockheed's first chief engineer for the F-117 Nighthawk. Rather than quote him, I'll let Mr. Brown do the talking for himself. Very simply, if I'm looking at a flat surface at right angles to the radar, if something like this were one square meter, it would have a radar return of a thousand square meters. If I move it back just about eight degrees, not very much, it drops from a thousand square meters to one square meter. And if I move it down to a very shallow angle, like about 20 degrees to horizontal, it's now down to one ten millionth of what it was when it was up there. While canted vertical tails and internal weapon storage capabilities did have appreciable effects on the fighter's radar return, it was probably the inclusion of radar absorbent materials in its paint that would really help press it further toward that low observable side of the spectrum. Radar arrays work by projecting electromagnetic energy into the sky and reading what's bounced back at it. Radar absorbent materials work by absorbing that electromagnetic wave energy to minimize the intensity of any reflected signals. Rams used on modern stealth fighters to minimize the radar return created by parts of their designs that just couldn't be adjusted to deflect radar away. Things like ramjet inlets, the fighter's nose, and the leading edges of its wings. Now this goes far in helping stealth fighters hide from radar, but it's important to remember that fifth generation jets are designed from the ground up to deflect electromagnetic energy. When you add RAM to a fourth generation fighter like the F-15, it's gonna help, but the effect just won't be as pronounced. Now before we go any further in this conversation, I wanna add a disclaimer, because not only do radar cross-sections vary depending on the angle you're observing the aircraft from, but radar cross-sections in general are widely debated online. And as may come as little surprise to you, national governments aren't often in the habit of stepping in to clarify these types of things. In other words, it's important that you take this and all conversations about radar cross-sections that you find on the internet with a big grain of salt. Let's try to look at historical precedent here, because the F-15 isn't the only fourth-generation American fighter to get the stealth treatment. All the way back in 2012, America's Wild Weasel F-16s started getting a radar-absorbent treatment called Have Glass. In effect, these F-16s have been receiving the same radar-absorbent material treatments that one might find on a fifth-generation fighter. Now, over the years, there have been different iterations of the Have Glass treatment, and the most recent one, ironically known as the fifth generation Have Glass, has been estimated to drop the F-16's radar return by an absolutely mind-boggling 76%. In other words, just by using RAM, they were able to shrink the Viper on radar screens from 5 square meters to just 1.2. Of course, the F-16 started out with just a way smaller radar cross-section than the F-15, at 5 square meters for the F-16 versus 25 for the F-15. But if we're to apply the same arithmetic to the Silent Eagle, we're now talking about an F-15 with a radar cross-section of just 6 square meters, before making considerations for the canted tail section or internal weapons carriage capabilities. But that is a gross generalization that doesn't take into account things like the fact that radar cross-sections are usually calculated without carrying any weapons, and the fact that the F-16 and F-15 are very different design. But with modern radar absorbent materials rated to absorb 70 to 80 percent of inbound electromagnetic energy, it does sound like the F-15 SE really could have been the sneakiest eagle this world will ever see. But even the stealthiest F-15 is still a long way off from stealth. Let's say the Silent Eagle had a 5 square meter radar cross-section, Five meters is two and a half times the height of Andre the Giant. The F-22's radar cross-section is said to be about the size of a marble, and the F-35's more like a ping-pong ball. But according to Boeing, the Silent Eagle did have an extremely small radar cross-section directly from the front. In fact, they claimed at one point that it was on par with the F-35's, though they would walk those claims back, especially after being called out on them. 
By the end of 2010, South Korea seemed pretty interested in the Silent Eagle, and Boeing showed the world that it wasn't just a paper plane when they successfully launched an inert AIM-120 from their prototype demonstrator. And by 2012, it was straight up competing with the likes of the Eurofighter Typhoon and Lockheed Martin's F-35 for South Korea's new fighter contract. Now, we won't get into the Typhoon here, but suffice to say, it was a more advanced fourth-generation design with a significantly smaller radar cross-section. But in the end, it would be the truly stealth F-35, with its cutting-edge avionics and data fusion capabilities that would win the day. And that would go on to become the trend. Between 2009 and 2015, Boeing would try to find Silent Eagle buyers in Israel, Canada, Japan, and Saudi Arabia. And wouldn't you know it, today all of those countries either have F-35s or are still negotiating the prospect of buying them. South Korea reportedly opted to pay $176 million per F-35, rather than just $100 per Silent Eagle. And if you think about it, that just makes sense. The F-35 may have its flaws, but at the time, it was easily the best fighter in production anywhere in the world, and today it remains the most advanced fighter in service on the planet. If you intend to fly a jet into the 2050s, it just doesn't make sense to buy one that was designed in the 1960s. Of course, that isn't the end of the Eagle story, because a lot of the updates and upgrades that were first intended for the Silent Eagle eventually found their way into the F-15EX Eagle II, which today is in production for the U.S. Air Force all over again. Now, this video got kind of long, but there's still way more I couldn't include in it, so if you're interested, definitely check out the full write-up on Sandbox News now. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.